battle for solar supremacy, two next-gen technologies are stealing the spotlight. Heather Junction or Top Gun? When it comes to real-world reliability, cost, innovation, and long-term degradation, who holds the upper hand? Let's find out. Today on Tech Titans, we've got two solar heavyweights, Sonix Energy representing Heather Junction and Solitech standing firm with the scale and versatility of Topcon. I'm your host, Tremaine. And I am Jez. I'll be digging into the real world trade-offs, materials, costs, and reliability, so we can see which tech truly stands up when it matters most. Let's now meet the two companies at the heart of today's technology face-off. Uh, my name is Eric and I'm from uh, the sales uh, department. I'm uh, in charge uh, part of the sales. Mainstream of our products still the also the N-Type. And we cover both uh, the Topcon and the uh, HDT as well. I'm Vilus, uh, the Solitech. I'm responsible for the product development. So basically everything from the technical part to the certification and the documentational part. Uh, the Solitech itself is a Lithuanian-based manufacturer of the solar modules and the battery. The business itself was started in the 2009. I want to begin with a few foundational points just to help frame where each technology stands today and how you see it evolving. Let's start with Eric from Sonics. Eric, HDT is often cited as one of the most promising next-gen technologies in solar. In your view, what makes HJT a serious contender for the next year of solar technology? From my opinion, the HJT it benefits from uh, the dual uh, passivation of uh, amorphous silicon on sub uh, substrate service defects, uh, resulting in higher photoelectric conversion efficiency compared to Topcon. And additionally, HJT integrates the advantages of thin film and crystalline silicon offering a let's say better beneficiality normally for the HGT it is above 90% and a lower temperature coefficient which could be as low as 0.25% Celsius minimizing performance degradation in high temperature areas and this also demonstrates its significant potential for boosting energy yield so Willis, Hopcon still relies on traditional production techniques does this make it less viable compared to HJT's lower energy production methods? I would say no, not at all. I mean, each product has its own advantages. In general, I agree that lower energy use during the production process is a positive step forward. Uh, just at the same time, low temperature soldering process of heterojunction, uh, well, that allows to have the lower energy use, is the process that brings to the table additional quality concerns. So. This manufacturing step isn't worked out that well, therefore a higher variation of the quality can be seen between different manufacturers of the header junction modules. Therefore, I don't see the Topcon module as less viable apps. It's more well known to the industry product, I would say. Thanks for those insights, everyone. Now that we've laid out the fundamentals, it's time to turn off the hit a little. So, Jess, over to you. Let's start with technical and material reliability, the part that decides how long these panels truly last. So Eric, TCO, transparent conductive oxide layers in HJT are known weak points. What concrete steps are you taking to secure long-term durability? Uh, first, uh, for the uh, durab uh, durability of uh, the HJT soft panels, uh, well, I would say that uh, for the HJT and Topcon, the if we talk about assembling technology, both technologies, uh, they have a similar, let's say, size to prolong the durability of uh, the solar panels, like to dual glass, which is uh, for the, if we replace the back materials from uh, the uh, foil to the glass, which uh, obviously could uh, prolong the lifetime and also the durability of uh, the solar panels. And another side is uh, to use the, let's say, more reliable uh, encapsulation materials, like, uh, the POE instead of a EVA, which is a very good, uh, let's see, um, a big change from uh, the solar panels. Going to you, Vilius, uh, with Topcon's ultra-thin tunneling oxide, how do you prevent long-term degradation under constant thermal and mechanical stress? Okay, so I, I would say there are quite a few steps to cope with that. Uh, lucky, looking from the perspective of ours as a solar modules manufacturer side, 
it's significantly important to choose the solar cells that are of a high quality. Since the issue with the Topcon is not that the technology itself is of a poor quality, but that there is a wider gap of equality between manufacturers if compared to birth. Uh, so proper supplier can be chosen by performing accelerated aging tests while developing the product and repeating it constantly during the production process to be sure if quality is kept at the initial levels. Uh, second thing is the proper bill of material choice. Uh, in this area, I can point out the use of the glass glass design of the instead of glass back sheet and use of POE elimination hole instead of the EVA or EP because both heterojunction and the top con are really sensitive to the hu humidity and the moisture. So I would say it's a good choice of the material by doing the accelerated aging test and choosing the proper bill of the materials. Eric, uh, thinner wafers face greater thermal stress. What's your strategy to ensure they stay intact after countless temperature cycles? For the HAT ones, uh, systematical structure and the low temperature processes it makes the HAT ideal for, uh, uh, let's say, ultra-thin wafers and also half-cell multi-bus bar or zero-bus bar design distribute thermal stress. I mean, this depends on the HAT cells uh, production and it makes uh, which is uh, even better. Do you agree that they are a bit more prone to micro cracks and warping during thermal cycling? No, no, uh, for the, during the production of the HAT cells, it's different from uh, top common ones. And it could uh, better to dealing with uh, the distributed the thermal stress, and uh, we don't think it would be a, a potential risks for the long term. Uh, let's see, like uh, micro cracks would happen. There are also the, the tests to show that for the thin wafer uh, thickness of the HAT cells, even after let's see uh, hundreds of the thermal cyclings, and the power degradation is also very limited. It's uh, only uh, let's see um, less than 0.4 percent. With Topcon's higher degradation rates, Ilias, is long-term performance just a marketing myth with a shorter shelf life than HJT? I, I would say actually that statement that Topcon's degradation is higher is quite a bold assumption. I mean, Topcon and Heterojunction share some similar reliability risks, while well, mainly as UV-induced degradation or resistant to moisture. Are there any environmental factors that accelerate degradation in Topcon more than in HJT? I would point out like the two main ones, that's obviously the UV-induced degradation, that is a huge risk, and the resistance to moisture. So that I would see as the two main ones. But yeah, anyway, they are more or less the same for the Topcon and Heterojunction. Next up, sustainability and production. Let's look at what it really costs to build these technologies and what that means for the planet and the production line. Jess, what do you have there for us? In this round, let's start with Vilius. With high temperature processing, how do you balance efficiency gains against higher energy consumption and potential cell stress. Okay, so it really depends on the perspective with which technology do we compare it, because I would look at it from the two sides. First of all, uh, as the module manufacturer, if we are comparing energy, energy consumption to the one that was used with the manufactured modules with the perk cells, the energy consumption isn't higher as the wall manufacturing process is identical. But what happens when you compare it with HJT? Uh, yes, with the HJT, that's right, because they're using the low temperature soldering, the use of less of the energy. But I think there is different perspective to look at there. For example, in some countries, main source of electricity is still a coal. While at the Solitec, for already a long time, we are using 100% of the electricity from the renewable energy sources. Uh, therefore, I believe that if thinking about environmental part, it's more important to check the manufacturer's CO2 emissions than its total consumption of energy per module. Because, yeah, it's not just the amount of the energy used, but what type of energy used. Eric, uh, HJT cells are using a lot of silver. How do you plan to keep this shiny setup sustainable when prices spike up? Well, um, actually, if you check about uh, the latest technology in the, in the market, uh, we already get these uh, new te uh, techniques to, uh, let's say, reduce uh, the silver usage, uh, like this uh, silver-coated copper pasting the grid. Basically, they mix the copper powder with the silver powder, wrap the copper coats with the silver layers, and you keep 
the silver is awesome uh, conductivity. The copper is, uh, but and the copper is also much cheaper than the silver. So in this way, it is possible to cut the silver use by 30 to 50 percent without messing up performance. If bifacial gain and long-term degradation define real-world value, how long do you think the Topcon can stay in the race without falling behind? Vilius? It really depends on the on the segment because what we see, what we at least in the market for now, uh, yes, the heterojunction has some technical advantages over Topcon, but it's still the Topcon that currently currently dominate the market due to its price and performance ratio. So I think we eventually to see the combination of both technical performance and price price conditions uh, to see what product is the best in the market. I think yes, the the material the material as we have both with the Topcon and Hedron Junction has its own limitations or let's say limited maximum efficiency but anyway it will not be phased out at all because it will be a good base for the upcoming materials eric if the glue's too gentle are we trusting these panels to stick it out for 25 years or just hoping they don't peel like old wallpaper well for the hat uh, the, the the whole let's see process uh, it uh, keeps uh, the t low temperature and every step it's under 200 degrees, and uh, we actually we pair with that uh, more flexible PoE encapsulant. You, you, encapsulant, uh, you get way less uh, thermal stress, messing things up during production. Uh, we let's see, we also let's see go through the less strict uh, about testing, like the uh, peeling test. Uh, let's see on the on the cells, and also peeling test between the the encapsulation materials and the glass. And also the labs uh, put these uh, panels through hardcore aging simulations, and these measures could really uh, guarantee that HAT solar panels uh, could keep over 99 percent of the packaging uh, integrity for a solid 30 years. We're finally on our last round, so let's wrap up with viability and innovation trajectory. Jess, you know the drill. Eric, moisture is a known enemy to HJT's layers. How are you keeping it from turning your panels into a slow motion disaster? Well, actually, for the it, it's kind of a problem for both, uh, let's see, um, Topcon and HET. And I would say that HET is uh, even more sensitive on the on the moisture. What HET solar panels we are offering is uh, the glass glass modules, which is uh, one side to block uh, the moisture and also use the PoE. And which also let's see, um, for the glass side, we, the, the glass uh, let's see supplies can also do the plasma cleaning and the added a water repellent uh, coating on the inside surface, which really stops moisture uh, getting in. Vilius, Topcon might be nearing its peak, but with HCAT paving the way for Tandem Tech, is choosing Topcon now just locking into a technology with a ceiling? I would say that the Topcon is still a good choice uh, for a few for a few reasons. Because when looking at the HAT, yes, as I already mentioned a few, few times before, yeah, it's definitely definitely has some technical advantages over Topcon. Uh, but when we're looking at the upcoming technologies, because as I see, from my perspective, it's not the HAT, but more like back contact or the tandem cells that are the future and the next next technologies. So I would say that. Topcon can as well be used in this configuration and it has its own advantages. And as I say, uh, while heterojunction has slight technical advantages over Topcon, but it's still Topcon that currently dominates the market due to its price performance ratio and easier production process. Uh, therefore, I, I expect as well then we'll have the transition to uh, new technologies. Uh, one technology, whether it's heterojunction or Topcon, will not have the, the wall market as a base material for the tandem cells as both of them might have its own advantages. You anyway choose the product that's best at the market at the current conditions. If HJT is so superior on paper, Eric, why are utility scale projects still lining up for Topcon? Are specs being ignored or is HJT just not walking the talk? Well, if we talk about a utility project, First, we have to consider about uh, where do you install the, this kind of a PV project. And uh, then the investors, they have to calculate the ROI. 
For example, for the the HAT, the production perform uh, production cost is still a little bit higher than the top com ones, and also for some uh, materials, uh, it is also higher than the top com ones. It makes that uh, the production cost is higher than uh, compared to the top com ones. So, if even though it is not that huge gap like uh, the top and uh, back contact technology, but for the utility projects, I think the ROI is very important. And uh, even if we talk about uh, 0.5 percent, if we put that into let's say 30 years, still a lot of money. So that's why I, I believe that uh, still there are more choices on the top com ones uh, compared to the top com. Uh, let's say compared to HAT. Is Topcon really future proof, Vilius? Or just putting a new coat of paint on a tech that's already losing the race to next gen disruptors like HJT and tandems? I believe that when we look into any technology, let's say that, that is not related to PV, we expect that each year or at least each few years it will have something new that is more advanced. So the same goes in our industry. I still strongly believe that the Topcom still have some time as a mainstream technology in the market due to its cost and performance combination. However, I would say it's in inevitable that eventually it will be replaced, but I see it not some sign of the weak performance or something like that, but more like a normal evolution cycle because there was actually a recently issued international technology roadmap for photovoltaics and it obviously told that the share of back contact modules will start over at the expense of the Topcon cells. Uh, however, it's important equally to point out that Topcon is expected to be more popular as a base material for back contact cells than heterojunction, at least according to that research. So I think while we not see the Topcon for a really long time in the current condition as it is, but it will still stay in the market as the base material for the new technology solar cells. Thank you. That wraps up my round of questions. Plenty to unpack there. Great answers from both of you. Over to you, Charmaine. Such an interesting episode that we have again today. So before we wrap up, any final messages to our viewers? Well, I would say that uh, each technology, they have the life cycle. Uh, we, we, just like uh, two or three years ago, that Proca is uh, the mainstream in the market and uh, then the market change uh, switch fast from a uh, P type to N type. And then we have uh, different directions uh, like Topcon, AJT, and also back contact uh, technology. Well, I would say that each technology, they have the advantages. We cannot see which one, I cannot, personally, I cannot see which one is uh, the best, but uh, it, it depends on the, the specific projects that uh, the consumers, uh, they can uh, choose the most suitable technology for the projects. I, in a way, would agree with Eric that each of the technology has its life cycle. So let's not look uh, as a disadvantage that upcoming materials upcoming technologies are coming because anyway heterojunction and back contact is very likely to serve as a base for those technologies so we simply will not see in the current state as it is but they will not vanish out from the industry thank you so much eric and Billus, for your valuable perspectives in today's episode we're not here to crown a winner we're here to challenge assumptions surface trade-offs and help the industry make smarter decisions if you've enjoyed this episode, don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Once again, I'm Jez. This has been Tech Titans, where solar sharpest minds go head to head and the toughest questions get a seat at the table. I am your host, Jermaine, and we'll see you in the next one, only on ENF Trade TV, your trusted source for all things solar.